This is Dr. Beth Smiller, and I'm here with Dr. Jonathan Kaplan. Today's date is October 17, 2018, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Kaplan as part of the Oral History Project, The Early Years <coughs> of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic, The PEPFAR Years. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Dr. Kaplan, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do. John, I've worked with you and for you throughout our 30-plus year careers at CDC, and it's a pleasure to be able to reflect on this with you today. During your career at CDC, you have had a leadership role for many different aspects of HIV AIDS care and treatment, first domestically and then internationally in establishing and implementing PEPFAR programs. We have a lot to talk about. But let's begin with your background. Would you tell me about where you grew up and your early family life? Sure. Well, first, thank you, Bess, for uh, including me. We have known each other and worked together for a long time, so this is a pleasure. I was born in Massachusetts and moved to uh, Ohio at the age of five, so I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, through, uh, and lived there through high school. Went away to college in upstate New York and then New York City, um, both at Cornell University, uh, undergrad and medical school. And then uh, sometimes I joke that uh, with, with all due respect to people who live in New York City or in California, I was never a big city person. So I told people at Cornell, I'm going to go as far away from New York City as possible without going to California and went to New Mexico for uh, six years, uh, internal medicine, residency, infectious diseases fellowship. And uh, then I spent an extra year there in Indian Health, that was, that was an important year in, in two ways. I met my wife, Linda, that year. Uh, and also, that was the year working at the, uh, what was then called the Albuquerque Indian Hospital. I met a person from CDC who was out there working on chronic diseases in the Native American populations. She told me about CDC, about the Epidemic Intelligence Service, EIS, and one thing led to another, and within a few months, I found myself here as a first-year EIS officer in 1980. So stepping back a bit, what got you interested in medicine? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I was always interested in science. Um, and I was a, uh, a chemistry major uh, in college. And I, I suppose I had some peripheral interest in medicine at the time, but I don't think any of us in our generation can discount the importance of the Vietnam War and the importance of student deferments at the time. So I knew that I was going to, to need to go straight out of college into something. And uh, as I was in college, I developed an interest in not only chemistry, but also biology. And I found myself applying to uh, medical school. Uh, but actually, I can, I can do more with that one because, so I went to medical school and uh, I was an okay student. Uh, being in New York City was a, a challenge for me. The way medicine was taught uh, in those years was also a challenge. We're basically in a classroom looking at walls for two years before we ever saw a patient. And uh, <clears throat> my motivation actually during those years was not the greatest, but then a very important thing happened to me thanks to a, one of the most important mentors and colleagues in my life uh, at Cornell. I had the opportunity uh, to go halfway around the world and spend a year in Papua New Guinea at a research institute. Mm -hmm. So I took an extra year in medical school and did that between third and fourth year. That was a life-transforming year. I mean, not, so? not only was it fun, but um, it basically invigorated my, my interest in medicine and in research and in the odd kinds of diseases you see halfway around the world that we never would have seen in New York City. And I came back from that year a totally different person. And, uh, and that kind of, from there on, I was just totally into what I was doing and 
From there then, I had a number of interesting experiences in my fourth year of medical school and then went into internal medicine, went out to New Mexico and, and did that training at that time. But that was a very important year. And had you this, had an interest in international and travel? Uh, uh, how did you take up this opportunity? So I suppose I had some interest in travel, but I had never... Um, done much internationally, except for the year after I graduated from college. I went to Europe just for the summer. And I remember that being a wonderful summer. I was a young guy and hitchhiked around Europe and went to a dozen countries. So I had a bit of the travel bug. But I think that was pretty much the extent of international travel until this opportunity came along. And this was a uh, this is a fabulous, uh, I can tell just a little bit more because this is really fun. My, um, my advisor colleague was a neurologist and he had trained uh, in London with a New Zealand neurologist uh, who, uh, his name was Dr. Richard Hornibrook and he uh, in turn became director of this research institute in Papua New Guinea. So my advisor had maintained connections with this person and uh, created an opportunity for some medical students to take off and spend a year um, over there. So I took advantage of that. Uh, I remember uh, when the, uh, Dr. Hornerbrook came to New York, and it was almost like a, an interview in a way. Uh, my advisor, whose name was Fletcher McDowell, a famous neurologist, invited me to his house. Dr. Hornerbrook was there. And Dr. Hornibrook basically gave me a million reasons why a kid from New York would never want to go halfway around the world. And I recognized, well, not only is this a test, but I really want to do this. Mm. And so uh, anyway, one thing led to another, and I had a round-the-world airplane ticket and spent eight months in New Guinea. And to this day, it was just a fabulous experience in lots of ways. And as I mentioned, I just came back a very different person. So... Then you get to CDC, and what was your assignment for your EIS two years? So I matched in uh, what was then the Division of Viral Diseases. And uh, I had a wonderful supervisor who's still here at CDC. That's uh, Larry Schoenberger, who I, um, I credit as one of the great mentors, I think, of my career. He taught me epidemiology wonderful guy. And uh, so I worked on a variety of different diseases. That was uh, really a great opportunity <clears throat> there. Um, and so, for example, um, viral gastroenteritis, dengue, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We also worked on the epidemiology of Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is not a viral disease, but it was very important in 1980 because in the, uh, the swine flu, issue just two or three years before, uh, you'll recall that about 2,000 people around the country got Guillain-Barre syndrome from the vaccine. So there was still a lot of interest in how that happened and what the epidemiology of that disease was. So I, I worked on a lot of different things and also had some great outbreak investigation experience. And uh, nothing about HIV or retroviruses yet. That came a little bit later, but the training was great, and uh, Larry Schoenberger was just a fabulous mentor and colleague. So this was 1980 to Correct. 82. Right. Now, by the end of 1981, um, 159 cases of AIDS was reported, and it wasn't termed AIDS yet. About half were Kaposi's sarcoma and half pneumocystis pneumonia. But additional illnesses seen as possible manifestations of this unexplained disease were being reported in the same population in New York City and California. And one of these was the so-called generalized or unexplained lymphadenopathy syndrome. And I remember you did your first work on HIV AIDS exploring the natural history of the lymphadenopathy syndrome. So can you tell us about this work? What was the lymphadenopathy syndrome and how you got involved in studying it? Sure, um, so thanks, Bess. And as you're well aware, we actually worked on this a little bit together uh, during that time period. 
What happened was, so turn the clock back to 1982. So um, I'd now been at CDC for two years, finishing EIS, ready to, st I stayed in the same division, but had the opportunity to work on some new things. Uh, what we now know as AIDS had first been described in June of 81, so that was after I'd only been at CDC one year in that very famous MMWR, June 1981, when the first cases of pneumocystis and capacities were described in gay men in <clears throat> New York and Los Angeles. Uh, so here we are, 1982, and um, we had a number of men in Atlanta uh, who um, were actually referred to us from a um, physician who's still around in Atlanta, gay men with enlarged lymph nodes in their neck and many other places around the body and developed this name, lymphadenopathy syndrome. At this point, somehow, and I don't remember how the connection happened, I met Dr. Tom Spira, who I, I think uh, has been interviewed as part of this project. Tom's a remarkable guy, still works at CDC, still a friend. Uh, Tom's main, he was an immunologist and a clinician by training, and I think he ran the immunology lab at CDC. And he developed a connection uh, with this um, practitioner uh, in Atlanta, and now we had access to all these young gay men who had enlarged lymph nodes. But we also knew that they had, some of them had a history of these other diseases that were becoming known as AIDS. So we knew there was a connection here. We didn't know exactly what it was yet. The virus wasn't discovered till a couple of years later. But we developed a, with Tom, and he invited me to join him, we developed a, a group of 78 men, all of whom were men who had sex with men from Atlanta who had enlarged lymph nodes. We developed, a, we were epidemiologists, we developed a case definition for this syndrome. Um, a couple of years later, when HIV was discovered uh, and a test developed, 75 of the 78 men uh, were found to be HIV positive. And we followed these men for years. And um, How so? Were, uh, <clears throat> can I ask, uh, now, as CDC epidemiologists, medical officers, we don't usually see patients clinically. Where did you see these patients? In offices? And so the, how, did that, um, how did that work? The men came to us. They came to CDC. They came in the building, and they met us up uh, in one of the rooms in the immunology branch where Tom worked. So we'd meet them there. And uh, there were a number of things that we did with them. Um, we obtained their histories, what was happening with their illnesses. We uh, took careful measurement of all their lymph nodes in the neck and other places. Uh, Tom's main interest being immunology took a lot of blood samples from these men. And um, over the years, we learned a remarkable number of things about what became known as HIV later. And um, I can't remember exactly how many years we continued to do this, but unfortunately, these men came around in the wrong time of history because uh, this is the early 80s. Uh, so we discovered the virus. Uh, it was discovered in 84. We now knew what they had, but we didn't have the HIV drugs yet. Uh, so these men were one by one coming down with these uh, pretty awful opportunistic infections, which I know we'll be talking a little bit more about here in due course. Uh, but we had no HIV-specific drugs. The first one that came around there was AZT, which was 1987. And then a couple more came around, but we didn't have what we now know as the combination powerful antiretroviral drug combinations until 1996. So most of these men died. And uh, when I think back, and I'm really, I'm glad to have the opportunity to say this now, because I don't know that I've ever done, said this publicly. I think these men were heroes. You think of what they did. They came to us, they drove their cars, parked here, came into our offices, endured our questions about uh, their histories. We felt their lymph nodes, took a lot of blood samples. The only thing that they ever got or were ever promised was that the knowledge that they were contributing to something that was, would hopefully um, help people in the future. And I, I think they were, they were real public health heroes for helping us. And, and as I mentioned before, because of the time of history they came around, uh, 
essentially all of them have passed away. Not all of them, and actually that's another couple of story that I can get into if you'll permit, permit me here. But anyway, we learned a, a tremendous amount from these men. In fact, the 75 HIV infected men, um, Tom Spiro would probably answer this better than I, but I would bet that we, that we ended up with one scientific, man, or maybe a scientific manuscript for every two of those. At least 30 to 40 papers came out of this. Um, so this is unusual for CDC. Did you need special permission to see no. patients, to draw blood? How did, uh, I'm not familiar with something like this before or since. How, how did it work? So Tom Spiro would be the one to really best answer that question. He was the primary investigator. So there was a protocol and it went through whatever approvals that we had to go through in those days. So it was all uh, accepted. People knew what we were doing. Um, and it was uh, under research, I'm sure, in, in some form. So uh, we had a protocol and there, the various questions we're trying to answer were, um, were articulated in the protocol. Mm -hmm. okay. But in terms of clinical care, again, the men came here, we drew blood, uh, but we uh, were not providing for their care. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was understood. We were not their doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, their primary doctor was, as I mentioned, the one person who, uh, um, who was in Atlanta. His name was Dr. Jim Brody, who took care of all these men. Mm -hmm. So their care was not here. So yes, it was a unusual situation because um, this is, in a way, it was clinical research right. in a way, which we don't generally do at CDC. Right. Uh, what uh, you mentioned that there were many papers written. Can you share with us what some of the key findings were? Sure. Well, there were... Um, this was before you could, you know, early on it was before you could do right. HIV testing, but there were a lot of immunology -ish questions. And so as I mentioned, Tom, and uh, Tom's main interest was immunology. He was and is an immunologist, and he was the primary investigator on this project. That was his main interest about um, trying to learn as much as possible about the immunologic abnormalities and the evolution of the immunologic abnormalities in these patients. So now we think generally of a CD4 lymphocyte count. That's our measure of immunologic mm -hmm. function in HIV patients. So that was one of many, many tests that okay. Tom was performing in his laboratory. He was looking at all kinds of markers of CD4 cells, their function and their enumeration. CD8 cells, uh, there were probably a lot of other things he looked at too. So that was his, uh, his main interest. And he would be the one to ask about the most important immunologic findings he made. I think we were ra gradually learning in, in this, this <clears throat> project certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, reinforced that the depletion of CD4 cells was the single most important marker for immunologic function and for susceptibility to all the horrible infections that these patients were getting. So now but, we, we think of the lymphadenopathy syndrome as sort of an early manifestation, but I'm sure some people progressed at different rates. Do you remember some of the opportunistic infections you saw at this stage? Sure. Um, well, for, just like you said, I th the most important marker for progression, I think, turned out to be the CD4 lymphocyte count, and that finding is certainly held up to this, uh, this day. But we also, um, well, I'll mention a couple things. Uh, we learned about some other markers that were important, too. In fact, when we, when we look back, I think that we may have been one of the first to describe a low hemoglobin as an important marker for immunoprogression. We described that. Subsequently, lots of other investigators described that. A very simple marker for how ill and how quickly the person will become ill. So I remember that was one thing that we, we learned. So we recorded uh, their histories of the various infections they were getting, and they were the ones that other AIDS patients were getting uh, at that time. Pneumocystis, pneumonia, Kaposi, sarcoma. Mycobacterium avium complex, all the things that became wrapped up in the AIDS definition these patients developed. So we knew from the beginning this is all connected mm -hmm. in some way. We just weren't sure how yet until HIV itself was discovered and then things started to piece together a little bit more. We also, I remember, learned some interesting behavioral things. And we got into all kinds of things with these men. And I remember 
one just small thing that we wrote when we asked um, these uh, young gay men how what they were doing about their sexual behaviors. And I remember learning that the most profound factor for changing behavior was having someone very close to them, like a partner, die of AIDS, which I thought was a, that was a really important thing to know at that time because we were very interested in behavioral change. You know, what does it take for people to change these high-risk behaviors? Does it take really a loved one dying? This is one of many things we learned from these men. As I mentioned, there are upwards of 30 or maybe 40 papers that we ended up getting from this whole experience. Let's move to 1993, when you became Assistant Director for Opportunistic Infections, or OIs, for the Division of HIV AIDS, and then the Associate Director for OIs in the Division of AIDS STD and TB Lab Research. Here you were in charge of a large research program with the objective of reducing OIs. This was at a time when the number of AIDS cases had risen exponentially. So by 1993, there were an estimated 174,000 cases of AIDS in the U.S., with about 50% of these patients dying. So what diseases were killing all of these AIDS patients? Okay, so a very broad question. Um, before we get there, if you'll permit me, there's one other anecdote I just wanted to throw in about the earlier discussion topic. I still take care of one of these men who, uh, who had lymphadenopathy syndrome. As, as I mentioned, they all came around at the wrong time of history, and most of them died. I thought they had all died. Um, about two years ago, I still do some clinical work at the VA hospital here in Atlanta. I take care of HIV patients. And I saw a man who came in, and I had never seen him before, and I introduced myself. I said, I'm, I'm Dr. Kaplan. I don't think we've met. And he said, oh, yes, we have. And, okay, can you uh, enlighten me here? And all of a sudden, uh, the memories started light lightening. He obviously looked a little bit different. This is 30 years later. Uh, but he was one of our men who clearly survived. He was lucky enough to survive that whole time. A few people did, I guess. And uh, he had been in and out of care in different places, including at the VA, but I just had never seen him. And now he's my patient. And uh, so I can say he's my longest standing patient. I've known him for over 30 years. I actually ran into another one in Atlanta, too. So. Anyway, just getting back to that experience, it was a remarkable experience. Okay, but now we're transitioning to a, a new time. So there was a time in between for, and we're up to 1993. So I actually had the opportunity while I was in viral diseases to work on some non-AIDS related retroviruses. We won't go into that because they're much less important than, uh, than, than HIV. But in 1993, I had the opportunity to move over to the Domestic AIDS Division. Division it was Division of HIV AIDS Prevention, run by Harold Jaffe. So Harold, longtime friend, colleague, hired me. And um, so this is what we were faced with at the time. Um, HIV was essentially a death sentence. Um, men, mostly men, in the United States uh, <clears throat> were dying of these pretty awful diseases, which we call opportunistic infections, meaning as the CD4 count declines, immunologic function deteriorates, people become susceptible to a wide variety of these infections. We mentioned a couple of them, pneumocystis, uh, was then pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. Now uh, the, uh, act, the name of the bug has changed uh, to um, what we call pneumocystis gyrovecchi, but we just still call it pneumocystis pneumonia. Kaposi's sarcoma and actually mycobacterium avium complex, I've mentioned these, there are actually over 20 of these infections that were incorporated into the AIDS case definition. And so um, a, a variety of diseases caused by viruses, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, uh, all of these. Um, so men, uh, mostly men, again, were dying of all these diseases. Um, we had, at that time in 1993, AZT, which had come around in 1987, and also a couple of other drugs. We had uh, 
DDI and DDC, but these drugs were not really saving people's lives. The, the powerful combination antibiotics didn't come around till 1996, which was later. So I came to work for Herald, and <clears throat> so I'll throw a couple of other things in here. In terms of trying to do something about these infections, we, as I mentioned, could really do nothing about the underlying cause other than these <clears throat> drugs like AZT, which really weren't doing that much. But for pneumocystis pneumonia, we knew that there was a combination antibiotic, uh, which we commonly know as Bactrim. <clears throat> Chemically, it's called trimethyrphan sulfamethoxazole. It's a combination of two drugs, which could, given to people with advanced HIV, that is, people with CD4 counts less than 200, uh, prevent um, pneumocystis pneumonia. And in 1992, a group of people, I had not, was not yet involved in that because I came over in 1993, but um, a group of people at CDC and NIH and probably some people in academ academia put out some recommendations for prevention of pneumocystis pneumonia using Bactrim. This was published in uh, 1992 in MMWR. And in 1993, there were similar recommendations for children who also developed this disease and uh, could be prevented using this um, drug called Bactrim. In 1994, Mycobacterium avium complex was addressed in a similar way. So it was around the time I came over and there were guidelines for preventing that disease. So Harold and I, when I came over, thought, and I uh, can't remember exactly where the idea came from, probably came from Harold because he's such a smart guy. Uh, why don't we address this systematically? Uh, there are over 20 of these AIDS-defining conditions. So, okay, we've dealt with pneumocystis pneumonia, we've dealt with mycobacterium avium complex. Can we look at all of them in a systematic way to see how can we prevent these infections uh, in uh, our patients with HIV? And we knew that there was a combination of approaches for the, the ones that I just mentioned. There were, we call it, antibiotic chemoprophylaxis, basically medicines to prevent the disease. There was also at least one that would be bacterial pneumonia where we could vaccinate people uh, against uh, the pneumococcus, pneumococcal um, bacterial disease. And then there were um, a number of, of these conditions for which various exposures, environmental exposures, for example, or behaviors might be able to prevent some of these diseases. And an example I'll mention here is pets, particularly cats, which is a whole interesting discussion, which maybe we can talk a little bit more about. And then for some of them, we knew that there's no way at all that we can prevent this disease. So uh, we thought, okay, how can we go about and do this uh, uh, in a systematic way? So um, this is my job then at the time. I, I had a title um, called Associate Director for Opportunistic Infections. We obviously made that title up. I worked uh, in the office of the director in, in Harold's division. So we put together a collaborative group. Uh, we got um, the National Institutes of Health involved, and my main colleague there was Henry Masur, and then the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and the main colleague there at the time was King Holmes, who was from the University of Washington. To this day, I remain friends with these guys. And uh, it, this is a collaboration that just worked really well. We uh, had to engage a lot of other people, a lot of people from academia who are uh, subject matter experts in a lot of these diseases, and also people with HIV. And I want to be able to say some, something more about that because I, I learned a lot in this process about listening to people, particularly our, the people who are trying to help. So we put together a consortium of people, and we had a big meeting. It was probably back around 1995, and uh, well, it would have been 94, because we came out with comprehensive uh, guidelines. We called them CDC, NIH, IDSA, for the institutions I mentioned, guidelines to prevent opportunistic infections in HIV-infected persons. In uh, 1995, we had a big supplement in the first one was clinical infectious diseases. We had um, systematic guidelines for these diseases, and I'll mention a little bit more about the format for that. And also had background papers that people wrote about their particular bug. And we organized uh, 
uh, these in a, we were focused on prevention at the time, so we had to have a kind of a format. We organized these according to um, how to prevent exposure to the particular pathogen, and once exposed, how to prevent disease, like through uh, vaccination or chemoprophylaxis, and then also how to prevent disease recurrence, if the patient got this and they might get it again. So it was a remarkable exercise, and um, as I mentioned, I learned a lot about listening to people, and uh, so uh, I guess if, if you'll allow me, I'll just say a little bit more about pets, because this is a very important thing that we learned. We knew that there were some important infections you could get from pets, and uh, the most important one is toxoplasmosis, or uh, it's a brain infection, toxoplasmic encephalitis. That's a, um, it's a protozoal bug that cats get. Uh, and it's excreted in their feces. And for people who empty kitty litter boxes, there's potential for exposure to the uh, organism, uh, which then um, can end up getting access to the body, usually uh, fecal oral, so it'd be by mouth, and then could develop into a uh, form of the organism that can go to the brain and cause encephalitis. Well, it would have been very easy at the time to say, don't own pets. Uh, I mean, some people just said that. You know, HIV-infected infected people should not own pets. Well, time out. You know, pets are very important to people, and uh, they're companion animals. In the HIV community, we're very quick to let us know that. You can't tell us to get rid of our cats. This has to be a little bit more nuanced than that, so please think about that a little bit more. So we did. And uh, in the end, uh, we never told anybody to get rid of their cats. Uh, but we did make recommendations about um, ways to clean a kitty litter box, to make sure to use gloves, wash your hands, change the kitty litter box often, because uh, what happens is in the, the feces, it takes a few days for the cyst to develop and mature and become yeah. infective. The longer the kitty litter box yeah. lasts there, the more infectious it might become. So basically, the bottom line of that is we, I learned how to listen. Uh, and we had a lot of people at the table. We had, as I mentioned, government people, people from academia, uh, research people, um, but the AIDS community was a very important participate in all of, uh, of those exercises. Ah. So anyway, to make a long story short at this point, um, these guidelines first came out in 1995. They had, we know they had a lot of impact um, from, uh, from the readership of these guidelines. They were considered the main source uh, for clinicians around, and for patients around the country about how to prevent uh, these infections. Now, over the course of several years, a few things happened. Um, first of all, at one point in there, we uh, expanded to include not just prevention, but also treatment. Um, and we had um, several revisions of these guidelines. In fact, there are at least five up to about the year 2012, I think was the last one. So what happened in 2012? <clears throat> by this time we had, uh, and, and by the way, I should also mention that the pediatric group split off to develop their own guidelines, which are still out there. So our guidelines for prevention and treatment of opportunistic infections in HIV-infected adults assumed kind of a life of its own. It went through at least five revisions, all published in MMWR and other journals. The one in 2012 was so big, it became, it was the largest MMWR supplement ever published. Um, for people who know that publication, you know, to the extent that it's still published in hard copy, usually staples are used to put it together. We had to have a glue binding like a telephone book would have. It's a huge document. Um, it uh, basically uh, went through all the resources. Um, we could to get this done. MMWR did not have all the editorial staff. We had to provide some of our own. And uh, so we realized that here going forward, this is going to have to change. We're going to have to go online and get away from these hard copy publications. So since 2012, it's maintained a life of its own online. It's so still now there. You, you mentioned um, 
MMWR for this and for uh, use of cotrimoxazole for prevention of pneumocystis and so on. Um, can you say a little bit more about the role MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Week report, CDC's publication, played in, in doing all of this? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Bess. It's an important question. Obviously, MMWR was our primary mode of getting this uh, information out. So, and this is CDC's publication. Um, over the years, MMWR has had, always, always had the weekly, but have had different series of, uh, of other types of publications, including these supplements. So CDC was front and center in terms of getting this information out. Uh, right from the beginning in 19, uh, well, actually, yeah, go back to 95, um, we published in MMWR. All the subsequent revisions came out in MMWR, but we also used other medical journals as well. But CDC was always front and center in terms of MMWR being the main place we'd publish uh, these guidelines, which meant uh, not only a tremendous commitment from MMWR and their staff, but also from all the subject matter experts. So uh, we are a public health institution here with a lot of subject matter expertise. So for all of these bugs, over 20, of these opportunistic infections that we included, uh, we had subject matter experts uh, here at CDC. So they all participated and gave of their time to help us develop recommendations, do the research of the literature, write background papers. So there was a tremendous investment uh, in, uh, on the part of CDC, on the part of MMWR and all these subject matter experts to, to make all this happen. Um, at this point, um, many years later, uh, the website that maintains these is actually an NIH website. However, um, I mean, I did, I did all this until a couple of years ago when I retired, um, although they're still nice enough to include my name. But, uh, but the uh, subject matter experts are still mostly, or in great part, from CDC. Really? So, uh, and, and now the document is maintained online with revisions made as, as necessary. So it's still a collaboration as it was at the beginning between CDC and NIH and uh, actually now the HIV Medicine Association of the Infectious Diseases Society of America. But the subject matter expertise, a lot of it still comes from here. Uh, so a lot of the energy goes into it. But it's now a document that's maintained online and MMWR is no longer uh, a part of it since 2012. Now, um, you, you've been seeing patients at the VA. I'm not sure when that started. Um, did you experience patients with these severe opportunistic infections in your own VA clinic experience, although many of them might have been hospitalized, but even as an outpatient before heart was available. Did you see some patients with these opportunistic infections? Uh, well, the answer will, so first of all, I've been fortunately, um, during all my CDC years really, after EIS, uh, I was allowed to do some clinical work. It was actually part of our job in a way as commission officers in the public health service. So I started seeing HIV patients actually initially at the, our DeKalb County uh, health facility uh, early on. And then I switched to the VA uh, at some point. I can't remember uh, when I did that. Uh, as um, seeing patients in the outpatient department. What that means is the sickest patients who were admitted to the hospital, uh, I would not see because I was not doing hospital work. I was, if they can walk into an outpatient department, obviously patients are relatively healthy at the time. So uh, yes, in the sense that a lot of our patients had developed these diseases and had been in the hospital, I would usually see them afterwards when they're walking into the clinic. Mm -hmm. So I may not have been involved uh, in the inpatient part of their care, but I was certainly involved in the outpatient part, which involved not only the antiretroviral drugs, which obviously came along later, but in terms of um, preventing additional prevention for these opportunistic infections and for those who had had them for what we called secondary prophylaxis or 
chronic maintenance therapy to give them medicine to make sure they didn't get it again. That's so were you using fluconazole, for example, for cryptococcal meningitis, or um, was the mainstay Bactrim? Uh, do you remember what some of the infections you were trying to prevent sure. in Atlanta, Georgia? Well, not only Atlanta, but also around the country, because these the guidelines we developed were useful uh, around the whole country, actually around the world as well. But in, and I mentioned there are a number of modes of prevent, prevention, but in terms of antibiotic chemoprophylaxis, the main ones um, in use were Bactrim uh, to prevent pneumocystis pneumonia. And also um, we used azithromycin to prevent mycobacterium avium complex. Uh, interestingly, after all these years, Bactrim we still use for people who have a low CD4 count, even if they're on antiretroviral therapy because they're still susceptible. Uh, we now know that for Mycobacterium avium complex that it's becoming such a rare disease and people who are on antiretroviral therapy do so well that just recently, I mean literally in the past six months, uh, the guy, the recommendations have pretty much dropped for uh, using azithromycin mm. to prevent MAC disease. So um, I'll get to fluconazole in a, min in a minute since you mentioned that. So the main ones have always been Bactrim and up to the, up to the present time azithromycin to prevent MAC. Um, also vaccinations, particularly against pneumococcal disease, there are two vaccines we use to, to prevent that. Now, fluconazole is an interesting one. I'll just mention this quickly because there are fungal diseases here that we're talking about, candida, cryptococcal disease, uh, also some, some other ones that are a little bit less common. Um, fluconazole has never been used as primary prophylaxis in the United States. We've never recommended it. And, uh, and I'll mention here that science has to back up all the recommendations we make. And fluconazole was never shown to have a mortality benefit to prevent cryptococcal disease, um, mainly because uh, less of it here than in other places. Uh, for people who have had a disease like cryptococcal meningitis, then as chronic maintenance therapy, fluconazole may be used to keep them from uh, recurring with it afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it has a use, but it was never used as primary prophylaxis here. It's never been recommended in the, in the US. Okay. So in January of 2004, you moved to the Division of Global HIV AIDS to work on PEPFAR and soon became chief of the HIV care and treatment branch. So just to start out, what made you decide to work on, on PEPFAR programs? So at the time, uh, I had an interesting job at the time. Um, I was, uh, from our earlier discussion, I was in the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention, our domestic program, for a number of years. Um, I was uh, given an opportunity, or let's just say I was asked, to um, to become leader of a division director of a laboratory division. At the time, Harold Jaffe left that job to become a center director. So I became uh, director of a laboratory uh, division which no longer exists. It was called D the Division of AIDS, STD, and TB Laboratory Research, Dastler. So I became, even though I did not have a laboratory background, I did that for a few years. And I, I knew the whole time that this was probably not the best match. I'm glad to do this to the best of my ability, but uh, probably not the best match for my experience and, uh, and expertise. So around 2000, you mentioned 2004, I guess that was uh, the beginning of it. I was approached by R.J. Simons, who worked in the International HIV uh, Program, which had had kind of a, a, a life before then, actually that was called the Life Initiative early on and became a global AIDS program. Around this time, this was when the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief was getting started. It actually started with a State of the Union address by President George W. Bush, I think it was January of 2003, if I recall. So RJ approached me and he said, why don't you come over? 
And I, so I looked at this and I thought, hmm, um, this is HIV, it's international, a lot of resources are going to be coming down to, uh, to work on this. And as in terms of care and treatment, well, this is right up my alley because I've been working on opportunistic infections. So I think it took me about one minute to say yes. Uh, and uh, so I made that transition, came over. I think I, initially I worked for RJ, and then there were some changes uh, in the HIV care and treatment branch, and I became chief of it about a, maybe a couple of years later. And that's what I did for the last uh, thir 12, 13 years of my career. So uh, if looking back on those early PEPFAR days and years, you began to travel a lot to PEPFAR-supported countries. Um, can you just, from a broad perspective, tell us what you saw with regards to AIDS care and treatment in those countries and management of opportunistic infections? There was no harm. So at the beginning, this was an eye-opening experience. Um, so, uh, yes, I was involved in a number of ways early on in the, in the effort, but, um, and, and one of these was to help specific countries um, develop their, their plans. And there were three countries that I was specifically involved in as part of the initial, what we called, core teams, meaning you'd have a person from CDC, a person from USAID, a person from the Department of Defense. Uh, so I was involved specifically and spent a lot of time in three countries from the onset. Those were Mozambique, Uganda, and Ethiopia. So I'll mention Uganda here in that I'd actually had some experience in Uganda, which is uh, another really memorable part of, of, my, of my career. Um, I had been to Uganda a couple of times uh, early on. And um, the devastation from this epidemic was remarkable. So as an example, when you go to, uh, to Uganda, the international airport is in Entebbe, uh, but the, the capital city, the big city is, well, actually Entebbe is the capital. The large city is Kampala, which is about maybe 20 miles away. Driving from Entebbe to Kampala, it was amazing how many coffin makers there were beside the road. Uh, and it wasn't just one or two or three, everyone was making coffins. And people were dying like flies uh, in Uganda at the time. Uh, it was really devastating. Now, in terms of what people were getting, um, some, uh, some of the, the most important infections there were common with the, the United States, but actually the biggest difference is tuberculosis. And so, obviously, Bess, this has been an important part of your career also. But internationally, TB, uh, we came to know as the most important uh, infection in terms of morbidity and mortality is affecting AIDS patients. There was a lot of TB. In the U.S., it had been, we had less TB in the U.S., so it had been not as big a factor, but internationally, TB was the big one. Um, there was a lot of um, oral um, candida infections, which we call thrush. Uh, and um, could probably name a bunch of others. Kaposi sarcoma, there was a fair amount of that. So, in general, overlap with things we'd seen in the United States, but tuberculosis was the big, big, big one. And we actually, to this day, we know that's the case in Africa and other parts of the world. So a lot of TB and various other infections. So the spectrum was a little bit different. The important thing is people are just dying. And, of course, we're here now we are with PEPFAR. We have an opportunity to try to do something about it. So. Who was in, in these countries, Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Uganda, um, how was care provided to patients? Would they just go to an outpatient clinic? Were they dying at home? Was there palliative care management? Um, how was health service delivered to the, all of these sick people? Well, the health services were obviously inadequate. So continuing with, with uh, Uganda as an example, uh, 
Uh, the hospitals there, there were hospitals in Kampala, they were overloaded with AIDS patients. Um, there were, uh, there's an inadequate supply of people, of supplies, of diagnostics, of drugs. All these things were in short supply. Um, and the conditions in the hospitals weren't great. They were so crowded that people would come in there, um, there would be patients lying on the floor, they would be in the hallways, um, and their families would be camping out all over the place, by the bed, out in the, in the yard by the, by the hospital. So the hospitals were very overcrowded uh, with all those inadequacies, death rates very high. Um, the clinics were very meager at the time. Um, so at the time we started PEPFAR, there actually was a little bit of antiretroviral therapy, those are the powerful AIDS, uh, HIV drugs that were being administered mainly by, there was actually a leader in Uganda, a guy named Peter Mugenyi, who is sometimes known as the father of antiretroviral therapy in Africa. So Ugandan, he was working at a, uh, a research institute, which I guess included a medical facility, the Joint Clinical Research Center in Kampala. There were a few people getting these drugs, but for the most part, the clinics really weren't there. There were hardly any drugs there except for a unique place like that. And laboratory facilities essentially non-existent. So basically, people were dying, and the, and the, uh, the health care provision was poor. Now, looking at, at, at these countries, for example, as time went on, most of the PEPFAR-supported countries had CDC country offices with technical leads in, in the countries. Can you describe how, how you interact with that in terms of beginning to offer antiretroviral therapy and scale up services? Okay, so the important thing um, about the beginning of PEPFAR is obviously CDC played a huge role, but it wasn't just us. It was a U.S. government um, effort, which, uh, which was made clear from the beginning from our, our leaders up in Washington. It was an effort of uh, Centers for Disease Control, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, the Department of Defense, the Peace Corps had a role, um, and there were some other uh, agencies that played a role, the Health Resources and Services Administration, HRSA, had a role. Um, so we were told from the beginning, you've got to all work on this together. Uh, and so there are a lot of interesting stories about some of these initial visits to these countries where basically we're uh, getting together with people, many of whom on the ground had never met each other. Uh, but we're asked to come together and play in the sandbox well and come together with a U.S. government program, leave your uniforms at the door. Um, now, in, uh, in all the big countries who worked in the CDC did have a presence already. And, of course, our CDC colleagues um, had ideas about how they wanted to go thing, about things. Uh, colleagues from the other agencies had different ideas. So from the very beginning, it was a real exercise in collaboration and getting people to talk to each other, uh, which were presented tremendous challenges. Our CDC offices, you know, we have just fabulous people at our institution. And um, I think the one thing that was special about the CDC um, offices and our people at the time was a commitment to science-based interventions. We wanted, we are, have always been a science-based agency, and we wanted to make sure that what we were doing had a firm science base. Um, obviously, we wanted to accomplish the missions um, of what we're trying to do in PEPFAR, and care and treatment is just part of it, and that's the part that I did. Um, but obviously, there are many other elements to what we were doing, uh, specifically prevention, um, data management, uh, just a lot of other uh, counseling and testing. There's a lot of other aspects to what we were doing. And we had a lot of 
technical expertise in our CDC offices. So I think right from the beginning, our strengths were the remarkable people we had, and I'm talking about Atlanta-based people, but obviously the, the in-country staff who are in the process of being hired to be part of, of our programs. Uh, the commitment to science and the technical expertise, those were the things we really brought to the table. And um, sometimes people from the other agencies thought a little bit differently about things. And that led to just some, I learned a lot about collaboration and getting along with people during those years. How about working with the Ministry of Health in terms of uh, strategy development and implementation? Um, can you give some examples of how that did or did not work? Okay, sure. Thanks uh, for that question because it's critical. I think um, I mentioned that our at CDC we have a commitment to science. We have a lot of technical expertise. We are a public health institution, and a, a priority right from the beginning was to work with the host country government to try to make this work in a way that would be compatible with their public health programs. So it was always from the beginning a high priority for us in Atlanta and for our CDC offices to work with the ministries of health uh, with the idea that whatever we do is your program and eventually with a little luck, depending on in-country resources, the country will take it over. We won't be needed here anymore. So this is a priority for us from the beginning. And I have to say other agencies didn't quite Look at, look at it that way all the time. They didn't have the history of working with host country governments the way we did at CDC, but it was always a priority for us to work with the ministries. So did it work? And how would that uh, happen? How, <clears throat> how would that take place? So that, would, uh, that could happen in a, in a number of ways. Sometimes we had people actually detailed to the Ministry of Health to live there. Uh, and to work there, even though they're still a CDC person. It would always involve lots of meetings with the ministry, with people in different levels there to try to decide on the program and what we were trying to do. But sometimes we had people embedded there, and I think we still, we still do that. I mean, you asked about whether it worked. Well, um, sometimes and sometimes not. Uh, this would depend a lot on the um, kind of ex the expertise in the ministry, their commitment, um, and their their expertise in some of these programs. Uh, it depends a lot on people. So if you had really dedicated people at the ministry uh, who had the same goals that we did in terms of trying to help their people and and save lives, then uh, the collaborations uh, might work better than in other times when they were poorly staffed and they didn't have people or they weren't very committed or they were taking money on the side. I mean, right from the beginning, there's, in working in these countries, there's always an issue there, too, about whether monies are getting diverted in the wrong direction. So, so speaking so. of money, <clears throat> um, these were huge amounts of money. This was a $15 billion over five-year commitment, um, and so many of these countries would be getting $100 million, $200 million a year, money that they had never, never seen the likes of. How was this spent? What, 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 did it, what, what were the expenses in getting an ART program going in a country? Okay, so first of all, you touched on that the B word, the billion word, and that is worth emphasizing, that when this whole thing started with uh, President Bush's State of the Union address, it was mentioned at that, I think it was mentioned in his address, $15 billion over five years. This is the largest commitment to a single disease ever made in the history of the world. No one had ever, in public health, had ever heard the B word before, sometimes the M word for millions, but the B word was just unheard of. So this is a huge amount of money. And, uh, and so administering this was obviously a, uh, a huge challenge. And um, so in terms of the HIV care and treatment programs, um, we had to embark on a number of things, starting with purchase of the drugs. Now, fortunately, the drugs purchased internationally 
We're not the same as when we get them domestically here. Uh, there are various agreements, and I'm not really an expert on how this is done. Generic drugs, but also just agreements with drug companies to get drugs for less money overseas. So purchase of the drugs. Um, then you have to have the people so and the clinics. And as I mentioned at the very beginning here, we didn't, the infrastructure wasn't really there. There weren't that many clinics, and they were poorly staffed, and, and they looked terrible. They needed renovation. So we had to identify the sites. And then um, and there are a lot of partners involved. It's not just the Ministry of Health. There are a lot of partners that we gave money to, some of whom were already involved in a country. Let's say university programs, for example. There well, are a of those. Well, so some of the other partners in, already in country or, or soon to become in country working well, on so, setting up ART programs. So big one, um, and early on there were, and I'd be hard pressed to remember this, um, when you talk with Ted Ellerbrock sometime, he'll tell you about the so-called Track One program we had mm -hmm. that started from the beginning. He had we had uh, four main collaborators. One of them, for example, was ICAP. That's the International AIDS Program at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. So they were involved over there. Johns Hopkins had a program over there. Um, uh, and I'm, I have to remember the others now, but there were some programs, and they uh, initially became part of the so-called Track One program because they already had some experience, they already had some presence in Africa. They already had offices there, so they're logical people to go through. Um, so we had partners like this, and plus the Ministry of Health. So we had to uh, make sure we had the facilities working with them, the drugs, the training of people, hiring more people, um, the laboratory backup for the laboratory tests, the renovation of the facilities. When you looked at a lot of these places, the roof would be leaking and water coming in, so we had to do a lot of uh, renovations. Um, data management, keep track of what we were doing. So HIV care and treatment involved all of those things. And actually, that's just the antiretroviral drugs part. We haven't yet talked about the non HIV drug part of HIV care, which is a great uh, story in and of itself. But and just I want to get the, to that. Okay. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about um, the strategy of initially of getting drugs to people? Were were these services at, at, at a district level? Um, were they at the a higher tertiary care level, how did the ill get to these clinical services initially? I think as time went on, there was a desire to have it be more peripheral. But initially, right. do you remember what the approach was? So initially, um, we, had to, we, we had to get things going quickly because the idea was we have all this money, we want to get started right away. So at the onset, you want to work with what's there. So at the beginning, the places that could either were or could be, become clinics were generally in the big cities, affiliated with hospitals. So that was the logical place to start, right there. As time went on and we wanted to expand these programs, obviously we had to do more than that. We had to get out to more peripheral areas of the country, to districts and even communities, and, um, and find ways to develop clinics uh, and to get people out there and the drugs and the, all the, the other aspects of care out there. So it, I think it, it's fair to say that initially it was very capital city based okay. near the hospitals, but over time it expanded. And now at this time, you know, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of facilities in some of these countries that go way beyond the big cities. You mentioned beyond setting up the ART clinics, looking at all of the other care and support activities. Can you describe some of those? Sure. So this is a whole story, and it's really a, it's it's a wonderful story because it was another exercise in um, challenges of how we go about administering our programs. So besides the HIV drugs, uh, and we'll just say at the beginning. That was the focus, because these are the life-saving drugs. In fact, it was um, uh, 
Really, the, uh, the combination um, antiretroviral therapy uh, regimens, three drugs, that didn't come on board till about 1996 that really made all this possible. It wasn't until that happened until people started to think, wow, maybe we can actually do something internationally. And here PEPFAR comes along about seven years later. That's not an accident. Those drugs had to come along. Because unlike the single drug like AZT we had back in 1987, 1996 was a key year. Uh, <clears throat> that was the year that um, the, the first uh, so-called third most powerful drug in the, in the cocktail, protease inhibitors, came along in 1996. And then since then, others have come along. But these are three drug combinations that these really saved lives. So that's what made this whole thing possible. So that was always the cornerstone. And actually, I'll go back, I'm getting to your question here, but when the initial program was laid out by President Bush, and I can't remember whether this was probably articulated soon thereafter by our office in Washington, what became the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator, we had the so-called 2710 goals. So what were those? What that meant was over the five years and the, the 15, the B word, the 15 billion dollars over five years. Uh, the goal was to give antiretroviral therapy, these HIV drugs, to two million people. To give HIV care in a broader sense, I'll mention in a minute what that means, to 10 million people and to prevent 7 million infections. The two seven ten goals. Those were our mantra at the beginning of this. All right, so what do we mean by broader HIV care. In addition to the uh, antiretroviral drugs, we're talking about prevention and treatment of opportunistic infections with more specific modalities, not just the HIV drugs. We're talking about food and nutrition because a lot of people are starving out there. And in fact, on at least one occasion, I <laughs> remember going to, into a country and sitting down with all these high-level people and thinking about all the things we could do and somebody just stopping the conversation with, Let's start with a good meal. That's what these people need the most. There's a lot of malnutrition, so food and nutrition. Um, End-stage care, a lot of people dying, so so-called palliative care. Pain management, which a lot of patients in the final stages of HIV have. Um, social services, like for example, people are starving. How about just a little bit of a, a micro loan so they can make a garden and grow food to feed themselves, and maybe sell a little bit to their neighbor? Mental health services, treatment of sexually transmitted infections. These were all on the table to get to the 10 million. Nobody had really defined how we're going to do that. Uh, we called it care. Actually, it's another good story about that. Initially, that whole area was called palliative care. Now, that was an issue from the, from the beginning. Most of us walking around on the street usually think of palliative care, meaning care of a terminally ill patient for whom we can do nothing else, making sure they're pain-free. But there was a whole kind of field and very passionate people uh, who wanted to interpret palliative care more broadly to basically be everything we we're doing for all of our patients. So initially, this whole area was called palliative care. Subsequently, many years later, we changed the name. Uh, but so we had issues with nomenclature right from the beginning, how to define what we were doing, what the priorities would be, how to guide the countries. What do we do with this whole area? Who are we, what are we trying to do to 10 million people? And I was very fortunate to be involved in the leadership of this at CDC and also in Washington during this time. So I lived through all these years. And there were people who were very passionate about different parts of this. We have their whole agents or whole um, community groups focused on palliative care. And they would tell us what we should do and what the money should be used for. And then Which there were, community groups, communities? Well, there are whole associations. There is a... Um, I forget the names now. Um, there's the American Palliative Care Association, oh, okay. APCA. U.S. based, basically. Well, U.S. based, right. Yeah. These are non-government people. Okay. Uh, and then food and nutrition. There were people um, at, let's say, one of our sister agencies like USAID who are totally focused on that. That was their area of expertise. Mm -hmm. They wanted to feed people. Uh, well, you can't use all the PEPFAR money to buy food. So um, these are the kinds of challenges we... Uh, had to deal with their land. How do we name what we're doing? How do we define it? How do we um, 
keep from spreading ourselves so thin that we're wasting the money. In fact, I remember uh, the first uh, global AIDS coordinator getting up at one of our big meetings and saying, we can't be a mile wide and an inch deep. Can't do that. So um, trying to direct all this uh, was um, a real challenge. It evolved tremendously over the years that I was involved. I'll just say from the CDC standpoint, we're science-based. We wanted to make sure to do the things with the most impact. So the biggest thing for us right at the beginning was Bactrim. That was what we were focused on. A lot of the people out there didn't know what Bactrim was. But um, just like it had been in the United States, it could be a life-saving uh, drug overseas. Actually, for more reasons than the United States. In the United States, it's a drug that primarily prevents pneumocystis pneumonia. But in Africa, um, it prevents pneumocystis pneumonia, it prevents uh, toxoplasmic encephalitis, that uh, infection we mentioned, it prevents um, various pr uh, protozoal diseases in the gut like isosporiasis, mm -hmm. it prevents malaria. It's a huge issue mm -hmm. uh, in Africa. So just getting Bactrim on the map, making sure everyone understood its importance and using that, that was our first priority. But then, you know, we went on in a number of directions. And also, I'm, I haven't mentioned here WHO. WHO figured into this a lot because over the years, I was involved in a, at least three different renditions of WHO guidelines on the use of Bactrim, which actually goes by uh, the name Cotrimoxis all overseas. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a priority from the beginning. But managing all these very passionate interests and Trying to keep our eyes on the prize of what's the best way to spend this money was a great challenge. And I, I, I mean, I, I love the challenge. It was tough at times to get through this. Um, so the back, Bactrim itself was relatively inexpensive, I think. Um, what was the thinking in terms of how to, how to get it out in a widespread way beyond the hospitals where patients were coming in for the ART care, um, what, was the, what was the thinking about approaching all these patients, some in rural areas, some in peri-urban? Well, the first thing there was making sure it was understood who should get the drug. Um, <clears throat> and now I'd have to uh, really think back over the various renditions of the guidelines. I think I mentioned in the United States, we recognized early on is only the people with the most advanced disease who needed uh, Bactrim, people with CD4 counts less than 200. Um, overseas, um, we can be a little bit more expansive than that because, well, first of all, we didn't have CD4 counts on everybody. So operationally, it was a lot easier just to give it to everybody. And, um, and then if people had CD4 count capabilities uh, or other ways of looking at advanced disease, uh, it could be restricted in, to some fashion. But then again, remember the drug also worked against malaria and everybody gets malaria. So early on, um, some countries just gave cotrimoxazole to all the patients. And now all Uganda, the HIV patients? All the or? HIV, just the HIV uh -huh. patients. Okay. Uh, Uganda is an example of that. They were a real leader in that. Okay. Uh, other countries had a slightly more restrictive definition would based on CD4 count or advanced AIDS clinically. So would so, you find, did they just sprinkle cotrimoxazole to all the OPDs and all of the prenatal and TB clinics and... Well, so um, first of all, the, the idea was just to make sure people are aware of its importance. And then, uh, okay, drug availability. This is a drug that's commonly used and would commonly be found on the shelves in Africa for used for other things. Sometimes it's used to treat diarrhea. Um, uh, so it could be used in different ways. So people were, uh, in Africa were generally aware of this drug so it was out there. Now, from the beginning, we didn't, even though it's a cheap drug, um, we were trying to lean a little bit more on the host countries to provide drugs for opportunistic infections because we're having enough trouble fun funding the HIV, the antiretroviral drugs. In some cases, some monies were used to buy Bactrim or Cotrimoxis all over there. But in general, and this is true for all the opportunistic infections, from the beginning, we tried to lean on 
host countries with, through their own drug procurement systems to come up with the Bactrim. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work so well. I mean, the good news is they were familiar with the drug, it was cheap, and, most, and they, they had it. Because of other uses of the drug, we would, I remember going to many facilities where the drug would be off the shelves because they had used it to treat diarrhea and this person or that person and the HIV infected population was not getting it. So having different supply lines of what drug you can use for your general population and what drug hopefully you can save for the HIV patients was a challenge. So um, yeah, it was a challenge to get it out there. And I, I think after, I think over the years we succeeded in um, making sure everyone is aware. Now everyone knows about cotrimoxazole now. And I think countries have pretty much elaborated their way of their ways of getting the drug, but there were always that problem, uh, that, that that issue of uh, finding the drug had disappeared for other purposes. So, um, PEPFAR was um, an implementation, a program implementation initiative, not a not a research initiative, and I think that was brought out uh, quite a bit in the beginning. Um, but for things like cotrimoxazole, um, were there some implementation science studies done to, to, to see the effect of some of these strategies, for example, giving cotrimoxazole or fluconazole, for example? Can you share some of the, the attempts at trying to measure the impact? Okay, sure. Uh, thank you, Bess, because this brings up a whole, the whole issue of, quote, research in PEPFAR. Uh, as you mentioned, from the very beginning, this is an implementation exercise. Congress did not want this to be a research program. In fact, we used to joke early on not to use the R word. Um, however, when you're putting programs like this into place, you have to develop information to answer questions. Uh, the questions may be more in the lines of the operational aspects of what we're, of what we're doing, how to deliver care, uh, rather than, let's say, development of a new drug, which was never something we would do, uh, or randomized control trials, which was generally something that we would, generally something we would not do in PEPFAR. So we had to be careful about um, how we would use funds to develop new information. And it's um, somewhat humorous, actually, to think back of some of the terms that were used to keep away from the R word. Um, we used, uh, the current one is actually implementation science. Uh, I think operational research, even though it has the R word, was probably used, but there were various names used to <laughs> try to keep from using the R word, mainly so people in Congress you know, wouldn't get upset. But so yes, there were a number of projects that went on um, specifically with regard to cotrimoxazole, so uh, I mentioned um, a minute ago that this drug is effective against malaria. So that led to a number of issues. Um, should we be restricting uh, this drug to people with most advanced disease to prevent the AIDS-related conditions, or should we give it to more people to prevent malaria because anybody can get malaria? So there were studies done uh, in Uganda, for example, um, about um, what happens when we, when we give cotrimoxazole to a broader group of people and, uh, and how much malaria will we prevent and what do we do about that. So I don't remember the exact design of these, but basically studies in Uganda did show that uh, when we give it to everybody, we will prevent malaria and save lives. And that includes people with higher CD4 counts. Uh, so actually, uh, to this day, I think in Uganda, we're using cotrimoxazole universally. Mm -hmm. There are a few countries that are doing that. But that leads to some very interesting ethical questions. Like if you're trying to prevent malaria in uh, all of our HIV patients, what about everybody else? What about their neighbors? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, nobody has ever really gotten stuck on that issue. I, I would have thought that would have been a huge ethical issue, but it hasn't been. So now in places like Uganda, we give it to everybody. We know we're preventing malaria and, well, we could be doing the same thing for their neighbors. You know, we're not really worried about that. 
So that's an example of research uh, on cotrimoxazole. There's also studies done in children, which I'm less familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have learned, for example, that that drug in the African context not only prevents, uh, um, well, pneumocystis pneumonia may be less common over there or less commonly appreciated than it is here, but certainly toxoplasma, encephalitis, uh, some protozoal diseases, uh, and malaria, but also bacterial diseases. It's an antibiotic, a combination antibiotic, and it does prevent a lot of bacterial diseases, mm. and those kill people in Africa a lot. So, um, what about uh, fluconazole? So fluconazole. Okay. So, I mentioned uh, earlier that we have never used fluconazole as so-called primary prophylaxis in the United States, um, but Africa is a little bit different because there is a lot of cryptococcal meningitis. And by the way, that is one of the worst opportunistic inf infections to get. It is an awful disease. Uh, it's a fungal infection of the brain. People get headaches, which are often described as the worst headache they've ever had in their lives. They can develop confusion, and um, it has a very high death rate. It's a, an awful, and if they re are fortunate enough to recover from it, they are frequently what we call neurologic sequelae. They have neurologic abnormalities that persist forever. It's a really awful disease. So how do, what do we do about prevention of this disease, which is the most common serious fungal infection probably around the world, certainly in Africa. Uh, the most, well, I think what we know is the most important thing is to get people on antiretroviral therapy so that they never have their immunologic uh, status deteriorate to the point where they're susceptible to this disease. The people who are most susceptible uh, have CD4 counts under 100. That's advanced disease. So that's the first thing, is to, to try to prevent people from ever getting to that state. But among people who do present with advanced disease, and unfortunately there's still a lot of them um, around the world and particularly in Africa, uh, there is another mode now that we can uh, think of employing to try to prevent this disease. Now, um, to throw into this discussion, there is a, a test uh, that can be done on um, patient's blood called the cryptococcal antigen test, uh, which um, tells you if the antigen really means a live bug. It's actually a cheap test. It's actually in dipstick form now. Mm. So one of the last projects that I personally was involved in um, uh, involved a strategy to try to prevent cryptococcal meningitis in HIV-infected persons in Africa. The idea was to look at people with advanced disease, CD4 less than 100, and to do this test, the cryptococcal antigen test, and if positive, to give them uh, high doses of the drug you mentioned, fluconazole, which is an antifungal drug to try, to try to prevent cryptococcal uh, disease over and above the antiretroviral drugs that they're, they're getting. And uh, I had the good fortune to be involved in this uh, study in Uganda. And actually, uh, I'm, I'm happy to say that as of only about three weeks ago, the final paper was accepted for publication. I can say my CDC career extended right up to about three weeks ago. But we learned a lot from this, um, from this study. We, we know that um, on a population basis, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to demonstrate a survival benefit from the intervention because only about 10% at most of the people with advanced disease will have cryptococcal antigen in their blood. However, for those who have it, it will prevent, to a great degree, cryptococcal meningitis. So it is an, an intervention that uh, certainly needs to be considered. WHO actually recommends this intervention now. Uh, and in fact, they've gone a little bit, WHO has gone a little bit farther and actually suggested that if it's too difficult to implement, you could just give fluconazole to everybody with a CD4 count less than 100. As I mentioned, we don't do that in the United States, but there is some data to suggest that that might be valuable in Africa. So while that drug doesn't see a lot of use in the US, it's very important in Sub-Saharan Africa to prevent this awful disease. Well, you mentioned um, some of the challenges in working with 
the different agencies that were a part of PEPFAR. And you actually played a, a very much of a lead role in, in doing just that uh, for the care and treatment portion. Um, I know you were co-chair of the care and treatment steering committee initially and then co-chair of the care and treatment technical working group. Can you tell us what was involved in, in, in being chair of these various groups and how that worked? Sure. Well, this is a situation that evolved a lot over the years, as you can imagine. <clears throat> So if we go back to the beginning of PEPFAR, the 2710 goals, I mentioned the 10, which was HIV care to uh, a broader, in a broader sense than the HIV antiretroviral drugs specifically. So from the beginning, I was um, a co-chair of our interagency palliative care technical working group, which at some point, because of the confusion about that name, we changed to the care and support technical working group. Uh, and so the challenges were, I think I alluded to this a little bit previously, about how, of all the many things we could do with these funds, how to figure out the best thing to do to have the most impact in our PEPFAR programs, and how to agree on these things with people from not just CDC, but from USAID, Department of Defense, Peace Corps, the other players. So what we tried to do from the beginning is uh, do what CDC is best at, is focus on the science, what will have the greatest impact. And that's why, so early on, our biggest priority was with cotrimoxazole, to make sure it was out there, people understood its importance, and to implement it. Um, over and above that, we always did our best to try to, to go with where the science led us. And sometimes there wasn't much science to, to guide us. Um, at one point, we actually put together an evidence base for all the interventions we were considering. We actually published it in a, a supplement of the journal JADES, uh, the Journal of Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndromes, um, <clears throat> to try to summarize what we knew about all these interventions. So it's a matter of juggling what we knew about the science, and frequently we didn't know as much as we'd like to know. Um, going on what the, our programs in the countries had as their priorities. After all, they're our partners, what they wanted to do. Uh, and, um, and also, I think, um, individual expertise uh, and passions probably had something to do uh, with what we were doing. So for example, we had people at USAID who were really good at food and nutrition we probably ended up doing more food and nutrition because we had people whose whole career was on that topic. Um, but generally speaking, I think the idea was to let the science drive as much as possible what we did. But we had to juggle all those different priorities. And, and one of them was definitely passionate people at the table. We had a lot of those, so we did our best. Now, I'll just fast to go fast forward with that particular topic. <coughs> um, over a period of time, the uh, HIV care in the broader context has assumed, except for TB, which remains the single biggest issue to deal with uh, uh, in terms of opportunistic infections in places like Africa, um, the focus has shifted more toward getting more people on antiretroviral therapy. So in the last couple of years, uh, there was, we had no more care and support net technical working group. I became co-chair of the care and treatment technical working group, which encompassed everything, but we all understood the focus is really mostly on antiretroviral therapy. So that was what I did the last couple of years. I, I chaired that group. And again, the, the focus there was mostly on uh, the HIV drugs. Uh, to some degree, we touched on the other things, but basically now at this point, the other things are kind of left to the host country. Most of the PEPFAR resources are going into expanding ART, and a lot of the rest is left to the host country, which means in some places a lot of things are being done, in some places very little is being done. But actually, I think that actually is the appropriate allocation of resources at this point, because all along the, the big life-saving drugs have been the HIV drugs. Well, it, it, 
We can't possibly leave a discussion of PEPFAR without mentioning the country operations plan. <laughs> and this was the administrative aspect of PEPFAR calling for the development of detailed country operations plans, or COPS, each year as a means of requesting funds for particular interventions by specific agencies. You had a big role in organizing and conducting reviews of the care and treatment component of, of these COPS, and it was a, kind of a big deal. Do you want to describe a little bit about what that process involved? Um, sure. Well, actually, not only, not only just the care and treatment part of the COPS, um, we also played roles uh, in reviewing the entire country operational plans, which was, as you can imagine, a major issue, a major challenge to look at a whole country operational plan from a country, hundreds of pages of stuff. <laughs> Uh, and not just the care and treatment, but everything else. So I, I had to do that too. I think it's fair to say I always, I always enjoyed focusing on my technical area of expertise, um, but I did both. So maybe, um, maybe a few words about each. Um, so in terms of, uh, of care and treatment, as I mentioned, uh, in the last couple of years, care and support kind of fell off the radar screen a bit and we were focused mostly on the treatment. So here we played a role in looking at the, uh, our, our working group, our care and treatment technical working group, had a role in looking at these aspects of all the COPs. We had a lot of countries that we're talking about here. We were up to like 35 or something countries that would submit COPs all at one time of year. And um, so we'd have to, uh, to look at these as an interagency group. And the main things we'd be looking at would be um, the overall direction of the program specifically targets. What are the numbers that you're trying to get to? Because countries were being tasked with, uh, with, with reaching out to uh, and, and offering antiretroviral therapy to as many people as possible. And there were target numbers that were developed for all these countries. So how is the country doing toward achieving that target? And what are the obstacles? And what are their plans? How are they spending their money to do that? How much money are they spending on the drugs? How much money are they spending on renovation of facilities? How much on training? How much on the laboratory support? How much on data management? We had to look at all of these things with the idea of having the greatest impact possible and getting to those numbers as well as we could. So that was. Broadly, that's what we were trying to do when we looked at all these programs. We looked at, okay, this is your, your budget. This is what you're, you say you're trying to do. And also, you know, what's your track record? How'd you do last year? If last year you only got half your target, what happened? Uh, so these are all things that would command our, our attention. And um, in addition to looking at the paper that was before us, uh, obviously there's a lot of experience around the table who had been to that country. What's actually happening there? Are they really saying what they're really doing? <laughs> or is what they say is happening really happening? So we always had that supplemental information to help us. But the idea was to, uh, and then in the end, make a recommendation. Um, this budget is OK, but you need to shift that money from here to there. Or this budget is inadequate for doing what you're trying to do. You better get some money from someplace else. Um, so that was our job technically to do that. Now, I could say some things about the broader COPS, but I, <laughs> I'll just say that was a much more difficult process. Uh, and um, I always enjoyed the technical part more because the, then with the, the larger COP, you're talking about whole areas, not just care and treatment, but the prevention and the counseling and testing and data management, laboratory support, all the agencies kind of fighting for their part of the money very difficult uh, um, experiences, which to this day, I think are challenges for all the people involved in that, but necessary because somebody's got to do it. If you're going to give hundreds of million dollars to a country, somebody's got to decide whether it's the right amount because mm -hmm. we, we're, do, we're doing all this for, to achieve results. And um, so that's what COP reviews were all about. So as we're in closing, um, you were involved in the biggest budget single disease 
global initiative ever. Um, any closing thoughts on, on your part or on CDC's role in all of this? Oh, sure. I could probably come up with a few. Well, first of all, um, in my, I had a 35-plus year career at CDC. And I can think of lots of different phases of my career and what I did. In terms of public health impact, nothing came close to these last 10 years. Uh, <clears throat> In fact, uh, well, the numbers now, um, we are, they're up to, uh, we have about 37 million HIV infected people on the planet. And we're up to about 22 million who are on antiretroviral, antiretroviral drugs, 14 million of those with PEPFAR support. Is that a phenomenal statistic or what? Uh, at the time I retired two and a half years ago, we were just getting to the 10 million, which I thought was a great landmark with PEPFAR support. Now, according to the information I have, we're up to 14 million. Over 50% of all the people getting these drugs on the planet are getting them through PEPFAR support. And you think of the number of life years saved, it's just phenomenal. So just to have been involved in this uh, has been great. And sometimes you think about the tedious parts, like the cop reviews. You put that aside and you think about what we've done and what this has meant to all these host countries, many of whom, like middle-income countries, are starting to take this over on their own, uh, which is the idea, ultimately, they may not need us. So being part of that process, uh, putting these programs out there, saving lives, and watching some countries better than others, taking these programs over, has been um, a wonderful experience. CDC's role, um, I have, uh, I think about my, my career and what's meant the, the most to me, and I uh, probably way at the top of the list has to be the people I've been able to work with or did work with during my career, both in Atlanta and internationally. Um, the, the, the dedication, the motivation to getting this, this work done. Uh, it's just, that was the best part of the experience. And what, what I miss the most about working at CDC are the people. Uh, just a tremendous opportunity and privilege to be able to work with all these people. There were challenges involved, and I, uh, as I mentioned, getting together with the other agencies and deciding on a plan. I think I learned a lot about group dynamics and trying to, to work with, with other groups. Uh, and those were all lessons that I thought were valuable and um, probably helped me in other aspects of life, too. Um, <clears throat> but, but that was part of it, too. It's learning to work with people and listen. That's the main thing, is listening to people, listening to the patients, listening to our partners who are doing the work, listening to people from the Ministry of Health, which is not to say that everybody has the same competence and expertise, but you got to listen. And then in the end, hopefully have a path that'll be the best toward achieving your results, which is saving lives. So I... I think back on just the, what a privilege it's been to be able to be part of all that and to work with <clears throat> all the people who've had the same goals in mind. Well, before we end, I want to say that I was in your branch as you were branch chief, and one of my best memories are your branch meetings. They were very personal and always intellectually stimulating and uh, a great part of working at CDC. So thank you, John. Well, thank you very much, Bess.